again and welcome to Vance Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrett. And thank you for tuning in. Another hot, hot week, crazy yeah. hot summer, crazy 2020. Um, <laughs> before we get started, we have a great, we have a guest with us today. Um, but before we get there, I did want to um, just quickly update. Apparently last night at the school board or school committee or whatever the heck we call them these, de- these days, um, they decided that kindergarten and first graders will go to school two days a week and the rest of the week remote, but everybody grades two um, through 12, except for whatever CTE is. I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't technical have education. What is it? Tech school. Okay. Uh-oh. So the tech kids will go to school, but the rest wow. of grades two through 12, so 10 grades of kids will stay home remotely at least for the first quarter. I want to follow that up with something I've started doing every day as I look at the number of COVID cases in New Hampshire because all we are is bombarded with these numbers and there's this many and there's this and there's 75 million trillion people being tested and all this craziness. Um, Currently in New Hampshire, there are less than three one hundredths of one percent of our population has COVID. And in case and that just sounds daily. confusing to you, it's one in about 4,200 people. It's 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 so marginal at this stage yeah. that, you know, for them to keep the schools closed yeah, seems, seems, uh, seems, seems a little like a strange You know, decision. like, yes, could this blow up again? Sure. There's all sorts of things that could change. But right now, day to day, and I'm going to do this all through August, our numbers are declining daily. We knock on wood. There's been no deaths for the last few days. Even when there's there new been cases, no deaths of children at well, all. This is not really a di- in New Hampshire. No. There's this really there's not a disease that uh, affects younger people. And so, you know, it is. Changing. I think we're being a little, um, I don't know. People will say it's awful and it's terrible for me to say, but I do think we're caught up in emotion more than logic. But I don't want to focus on that because we talked about that for the last like six weeks. Um, so joining us today is my good friend Matt Mayberry. Um, Matt Mayberry is the former vice chair of the state GOP. He's a um, former Dover town councilman. He was on the Dover school board. He was the head of the human, or you were on the human rights commission for the yes. state of New Hampshire. Um, he is also probably um, the most active supporter of Republicans that I've known in my tenure here in New Hampshire involved in the Republican And he is Party. also the gentleman who will tell you when you have lipstick on your teeth. That's right. <laughs> uh, Matt, the, the, the talk of the day, though, is Matt is running to be the next representative in Congress for CD1. Yes. Um, and thank you for joining us today. And I, I'm looking forward to hearing um, good things from you and why people should be supporting you in September. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so thank much. You and, um, and it's great. And I got to know Carla because I also produced the best and biggest gun shows in New Hampshire. That is true. And, and Carla came and Tammy's, a, you know, with the Manchester Republican Committee, we'd always give free tables at the gun shows yep. because we, w- we want to help people. Folks view gun shows as this you know, evil entity that will sell guns to anyone who walks in the door. And that's not true. There are 200 small business owners under one roof. And my job is to make them feel welcome and get people in to see them. But it's also to amplify messages of others. When you're running for state senate, let's talk about you and (laughs) get you in front of, you know, 30,000 people. And, you know, Tammy, and your recruitment efforts with the Manchester Republican City Committee, do that. Come on and participate. Um, you know, I, I view it as a small business entity and yep. try to break down some of the myths. We worked with the Women's Defense um, Women's Defense League of New Hampshire, and we got them a virtual firing range. Yeah, which is always a hit. Which yeah. is a huge hit. Yeah, because and inevitably, there's always the Manchester cops versus the Manchester Fire Department. <laughs> and I won't tell you who usually does better. <laughs> but I'll let you g- the laughter tells we all kind of know who shot better. Um and it wasn't the cops. <laughs> um, but, you know, so so thank you for the opportunity. No problem. Um, well, I was going to ask you a little bit about your background, but there you go. You, yeah. you produce these gun shows. Um, you've been involved in city council, school board, you know, human rights um, issues. You have a diverse background. Um, I know that when you were the s- vice chair of the state party, you went to something like 350 Republican events. Um, because that's what I know you, knew you for first. 
whenever a good solid Republican was running for office, whether it's Chris Sununu, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's Carla Garrick, whether it's, you know, somebody in wherever. Dan Garthright. Dan Garthright, <laughs> all over the place, you know. Tammy. Whether it's somebody who's pro-choice, pro-life, you know, the 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 guts of it is we need to elect more Republicans because the Democrats are simply worse. Awful. A, a bad Republican is better than a good Democrat any day. I hate to say that, but that's the truth. I mean, and you've just always been there for so many people, and that's always been why when you said you were going to run, if nothing else, I felt obligated to do whatever I could to help you because I know you've helped me in the past. So, so you. maybe, you know, uh, some of the reasons why you're running, mm -hmm. like what are you passionate about? What do you think you bring to the table? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> And it actually has very little to do with politics. That is a good answer. That's a yeah. good answer, right? <laughs> it, you know, I didn't say like, oh, next on my resume is this. I right. must conquer it. It's really about people. I grew up poor in Maine. Uh, my, one of my earliest memories was my 12 years old watching my mom take off her wedding ring and sell it to buy us food. Oh, wow. Um, you know, Rotary Club brought Christmas. Kiwanis Club did Thanksgiving. And for the last 50 years, I've been paying it back. Um, because they went out of their way for me. I've had mentors who helped me and told me that you can get out of the situation. Um, ironically, it was women mm. who have been the biggest guiding lights in my life. And I never forgot that. So it's one where, I, you know, at 19, I knew I couldn't, go to, I couldn't afford to go to college, so I joined the Air Force. Went to 63 countries, 28 states. Amazing, amazing opportunities. Um, I was airman of the year for my squadron because not only did I do my job, but I helped feed homeless people in Charleston. I worked for a camp with kids with cancer um, because we'd have two weeks off a month, so I wanted to use that free time to help other people. Did that, and you know, a, a quick story that I'll abbreviate is we flew into a country and picked up some uh, freedom fighters. And we flew across the ocean and when I said, welcome to America, it was the one word that didn't need to be translated. Mm. They knew exactly what that meant. That meant that they were safe and that they were free and that they had liberties. And as they come out the plane, you know, these men much older than my, I'm, ni I'm 19, 20 years old at the time. I am truly a kid. And these men who are now my age were, were crying because they knew they were in America. And as a little boy who he g gave me his little thumbs up, because he had no legs Jeez. from mid-thigh down. And we were taking them to a military base in America to get health care. Uh, he gave me a thumbs up, and I took my U.S. flag and ripped it off my sleeve. Oh, wow. It was Velcro. So <laughs> it, you know, it, it sounds much tougher. Like I'm, yeah, I ripped it off. <laughs> it was Velcro. Made in New Hampshire, by the way. Um, took it off, handed the child, because he knew what America was like. That's what I want to do now. I see it all. You know, we were talking, you know, before the show that, you know, we're frustrated with a lot of things that are going on and we want to change it. And, you know, we want action and not words. And I got tired of just watching. I got tired of hearing the stories. I want to fix it. Right. You know, others will talk about a problem. I'll actually go and fix it. During the COVID, uh, the height of the COVID, COVID pandemic, I found 2,000 face masks for the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department. I found 200 gallons of hand sanitizer that I took out to lo uh, police departments all around our state at no charge. Delivered over almost 300 meals through the Stratford County Meals on Wheels program and found 25 Chromebooks for low-income kids. Wow. You're a doer. And I'm a doer. I, you know, actions speak louder than words. But the best part is for me, and people look to me kind of weird because we live in a weird political world. <laughs> I never gave out my business card. I never even said my name. Because you're just doing it because I'm just it's doing the it. thing to do? It's the thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And that's why I really appreciate the two of you taking your time to talk to me and let me talk about why I want to help you at home right. very much. It's, you know, I got into the race. The no BS reason is I found four veterans who were going to lose their access to mental health care because the VA wasn't paying the bills. I'm a veteran. I'm in the VA medical system. I know how painful it is. But, you know, especially viewers at home, you know how hard it is to get your husband to take an aspirin when they have a migraine, <laughs> let alone to say, I need psychiatric care. Right. It doesn't happen. I knew it was going to happen to the four of them. Got it fixed.
we found out that the medical community is owed $134 million. Our hospitals are facing layoffs. Right, and the federal government's not paying their bills. And the federal government's not paying their bills. And Mr. Sununu, who's chairman of the Oversight Committee. Mr. S no, Mr. Pappas. Correction, thank you. I was going to say, no, no. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Too bad we can't edit that out. But Mr. We'll Pappas. pretend it never happened. It never happened. It was a figment of your imagination. Just, um, But Mr. Pappas is chairman of the Oversight Investigations Committee. And all he could do is write a letter. Right, so his job in Congress is to chair the Oversight commi Committee. Of the VA. Of the VA. But yet people right here in his district. Are suffering. Are suffering. And of course, you know, it's with something like the VA, I mean, it's it feels to me, someone like me, who obviously I'm an immigrant, but I've been in the country for 25 years, and I feel like from the 90s, I've heard of problems mm -hmm. yes. with the VA. Yep. So how does one crack and fix that kind of nut, right? Because it's, it's, you know, Tammy and I frequently talk on the show about one of my main frustrations with big government is just, it's almost, you know, the joke where it's like, oh, we'll, we'll break your legs and then we'll tell you how to fix it, yes. right? Or something, yeah. right? So, um, so what would you see like something we could do with the VA? Like, are there more accountability systems we could build it? Like, how, how do we fix something like that that's been broken? for as long as it's existed, pretty much. It starts as simple as voting because we need an advocate like you in the state senate. We need an advocate like you in the House of Representatives because what happens is that you know your neighbors. They're going to call you first. Uh, Mark McLean, who's a friend of ours, yeah. um, he and I, you know, there was a gentleman who, you know, he didn't know where to go for his unemployment benefits. He called his state rep. And then what do you go from there? They're going to call you first. You're that first line because they know you. They see you at the grocery store. They see you in line for ice cream. They're going to talk to you about it. True. And then you can be their champion. So let me find Mayberry for you. He will drive to your house because I think we do this one case at a time. We'll never fix the full VA. No. I'm under no delusion that I'll go to Congress and, you know. Wave that magic wand and fix all the woes? All of it. You know, they're going to hand me the VA budget and say, Mayberry, we're so glad you're here. <laughs> Please fix VA for us. But what I can do is I can change a life. We can change lives. I'm going to take two small Winnebago's and outfit them as mobile offices. And so we're going to go to Home Depot's and Lowe's and Walmart and Market Baskets and to your driveway if you need help. We're going to be the DoorDash of customer service. Ah, I love that because one of my taglines is, you know, government. There's an app for That's that. Right. There's an app for that. <laughs> so and there's an app so for this it. is like the app step in between, it, maybe. <laughs> it really is because, because Carla, when you're a state senator, you're going to call me up and say, I've got a business who wants to increase their exports to Poland, pick a random country. They need your help. But they're really busy. It's a three person shop. I will drive to them and meet with them. We'll park my little you know, Winnebago out there and go help them because they're busy making money. So I think it's one where, you know, one person made a big difference in my life 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. You make a difference in lives now. We can just one life at a time because we all know that ripple effect. And I love that because that, you know, it speaks to my sort of sense of individualism. And yes. I'm really struck by what you're saying because I've been doing some door knocking. And on Friday, I ran into a very lovely lady in a part of Manchester I'd never been to. It's yeah. down on the river, but it's yeah. kind of, uh, you know, if you go b past those apartment buildings behind Rock Rimmon, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, the, the road goes straight on and it goes into Goffstown. Yes. But there's this little just neighborhood down there that's on the water. And yeah. I was down there, so I was sort of adventuring venturing and sort of <laughs> looking like around out yeah exactly. and so there was this lady and and you know staunch republican but you know she said something that struck me that's very similar to what you're saying is your philosophy she said you know i'm a republican because i want to keep my money and kind of spend it the way i want to spend it she's like but a very important part of my life is then giving back right yeah. because we don't necessarily want the government to, to do it i mean right. i understand we're all running for office so to yeah. some extent we do right but you know really we want to reduce that strain on the government and say to people look if you're passionate about something like you clearly are then Go do it, you know, yeah. go do it yourself because well, I mean, that's actually how we change the world. Historically, I mean, just look at churches, you know, look at the welfare system versus 
um, how we used to care for impoverished people. Mm -hmm. If you were poor and you couldn't feed your family, you didn't go to the government. You went to your local church, your local, and they took care of the. They took the care of their own. Rotary Club and Kiwanis. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They took care. They made sure that you had a Christmas. I remember that from from childhood. I come from. I come from an even more bizarre family because my father was a union steward, and we were poorer than poor, which I don't know how that <laughs> math worked out because. We shouldn't have been poor, but I grew up like you. I was very poor. And, um, you know, you didn't go to the government. That wasn't the first where the thing was. The community took care of the people who needed caring. And now we've switched so much and we tax people in order to take care of people that now people don't donate as much money to the churches. So then the churches can't help feed people. It's, just, it's a vicious circle. And I think, you know, it, it comes also into education. And we're seeing it right now how we yeah. educate our children. I think the Federal Department of Education should be abolished. I agree. All the money should stay right here in New Hampshire because you know how to educate our kids better. You at home know how your child's going to respond better in educational settings. Right. The, the money should follow the child, yeah. not the child have to chase the money to who has the richest district, who yeah. spend the most. You know, a friend of mine said, you know, she spends $13,000 a year in property taxes she goes, but I get no water, I get no sewer, I get no trash pickup. Now I have to educate my kids at home myself. Right, right. I mean, this That's remote right. education thing all sounds really fun and everything. I have, I work with a girl who has two children. She hasn't worked through any of this pandemic because she had to stay home because her kids were suddenly home. Correct. And it, she would love to come back to work, but she'd have to come work at night or on the weekends and like isn't that what the time you want to spend with your family it's you know, terrible i heard a really mm. interesting thing once and i i you know i haven't researched this entirely myself but this this person posited and said that if you took a dual income household right where both parents are working and you looked at what the lower uh, earning person mm -hmm. is earning they generally earn more or less what the higher wage earner is paying in federal income yeah. tax wow. and i was like wow right. if that's true wow. why don't we just eliminate federal income tax we would create stronger you know value-based homes you would have someone at home people would with actually their children. Be able to take care of themselves you, more yes. you know because part i think of this whole thing when we we talk about institutional stuff and systemic stuff and just government being too big is the way i look yeah. at it because we have just Absolutely. there's just too much of it doing too many things badly <laughs> um, is well you know couldn't we just do that because I imagine and look I have a lot of professional women friends who are like no I don't want to stay at home with my kids yeah. but oftentimes their partner is someone yes. who's like actually I wouldn't mind or hey I'm a techie I could work from home or we can afford an au pair and but I could work from home but be around. Option, at least. Right. right you know so so I feel like there's so much creative stuff we could be doing but the challenge really is because this this mammoth machine of the big government you know it's so hard to change things it, it really is but it, it's one where I, I do worry about those you know fourth and fifth graders mm -hmm. they're young enough they need someone to be home with them but also there's a lot of families in new hampshire that ha can't afford laptops no nope. That, but they also can't afford the broadband service or the internet at home. And so I'm, I posted online a article from the New Hampshire Business Review how they're offering school buses as mobile hotspots. That's to, interesting. To at least try to get to the bigger communities, you know, housing, you know, I live in a condo complex. Right, so a hub could a hub get could be all there. those kids. But, you know, so they have to do homework, but that bus leaves. Right. So now they're back in the you know, Without. back in the darkness, right. they, they, they don't have it. Um, because I haven't heard plans of how we're going to get these kids connected. Right, like that might not be a big, I mean, in Manchester, there is no, there's, I don't think any corner of Manchester that doesn't have access to internet. Um, whether or not they have actual internet in their home is one thing. Um, I mean, another challenge I've actually heard is in, in homes that have, you know, like three kids in school, right. you know, but there's only one device. Right. Yes. And then it becomes work? like, oh, you know, well, big bro is going to get it first because he can bully the little ones, you know, exactly. or how it works. So there are definitely uh, 
a lot of challenges. But I think we should look at the opportunities of something like remote learning too. Yes. Someone like me who thinks, you know, maybe we need to to break the monopoly on on schooling and education. Yep. And you know, there's this wonderful thing called the internet. So if you want to, if you want to learn, well, you look can at, learn. Yeah, there's you know? Khan Academy. There's endless educational resources available. I mean, homeschool families take advantage of a lot of these things, but homeschooling and remote learning are not one in the same thing. One is a curriculum based on um, a homeschool model, and the other one is, sorry, you can't come to school today, you have to and, and maybe that's something to talk about too, right? Because you you had mentioned you know mental health, you know yes. certainly within with with the met, uh, veterans community. I mean, obviously we understand PTSD. Like there there are lots of things that come out of that world. But you know, a lot of people are talking about the kids now that are feeling socially isolated. You know, there's there's a knock on effect here in terms of what we're w the decisions we're making now, which in my opinion are partly probably not the best decisions. Like I think we are overreacting. Um, so, you know, are in two years time, are we gonna start to see this huge like mental health issue well, coming with, with the kids who can death, play? Death by suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst young people after right. cancer. Um, it is a prevalent problem. I've been very upfront about talking about my own challenges with depression and considering suicide, you know, quite a while ago but it happens every single day. Right. Um, and that's something we, we do need to work on. But I worry about those, you know, we talk about, you know, VLAX. I, I'm, I'm the only one running for Congress who's served on a school board. Right. Yeah. And I've been a substitute teacher, so I've seen this, I've touched this. Um, I worry about those kids in, you know, not necessarily Manchester, but in Farmington, Summersworth, Milton, Wakefield, um, Tamworth that don't have those options right. because we don't have enough broadband service. The governor's done a good job of expanding it. But it takes time to, it for takes that time. to get there. It's not like you can just say, here's a check, and now we suddenly have right. broadband. We, we have to run wires right. and go through. Right. Um, so I think, but, but that's my job as a congressman, right. is to help and to help those folks and to kind of keep looking at that big picture and listen. So uh, I, I don't think we're going to run out of time, but um, I don't. I saw the 10-minute yes. mark go by a little oh, while wow. ago. <laughs> I do want to give you the opportunity um, to actually tell people how they can contact you, you know, who they should, how they get a lawn sign for their lawn so that they can tell people that they're supporting you and things like that. Exactly. No, thank you so much. And it's one where I answer my own phone. <laughs> um, so you could call me at 603-969-7077. I also answer my own emails, mattmaybury.nh at gmail.com. I'm a prodigious Facebooker and social media, uh, so I apologize. I will, I will fill your inbox, um, but I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Parler. Um, no TikTok at all. <laughs> no. Owned by the Chinese thing, they track you, so no. Um, Oh, we track us now too. Yeah, but oh, yeah. <laughs> let's oh, yeah. not pretend that, that yeah. it's a Chinese Ex problem. Exactly. Yeah. We, <laughs> we just don't need to help them too. Exactly. Valid point. Um, but it's one where I want to work hard for you every single day. I won't let you down. Um, we may not always agree, but you'll know I've heard what you've said. Right. And I'm accessible. We don't need to send another 30 year old millionaire to Washington. It's one, I've lived here for 35 years helping folks. Um, my opponent, he lived here for a year and a half, left, came back in January, and three weeks later filed for Congress. I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think you need to understand New Hampshire, and it takes more than three weeks. Right. And, and I, it, it, I always say I, I struggle to support people, not that I haven't, but I, I struggle when, if you can't even meet the requirement to run for state rep, should you be running for Congress? Yeah, that's such a weird little that there's no thing. Requirement. I remember who I was mean, that guy? Scott Brown, Scott the guy Brown, yeah. right uh, from Laura Sullivan. Like it's yeah, it, there's been a lot of those over the um, years. I think they see maybe New Hampshire as a but w we tend to take care of those folks. Yeah. They don't usually so work. I, yeah, right? yeah, we, we do we, <laughs> I exactly. Have, I have shared numerous times. There's a. a Facebook graphic that has a picture of New Hampshire, or maybe it's a picture, I don't even think it's a picture of you, I think it's a picture of New Hampshire, and it says, you know, Mayberry, he's one of us, and that's the yeah. way I look at it. I want people who I can relate to, who I know are here 
for the people in New Hampshire. And like you said, not just building on their resume for their future. And, and there's nothing wrong with building on your resume for your future, no. but I don't want to do it at the cost of the, representing the people. We don't want OJT. You know, on-job training as a member of Congress doesn't work. Right. You need to have some life experience, whatever that is, to bring it through because you have to understand, you know, when the economy collapsed, I lost my housing, I lost my income. So I challenged with the IRS because of it. I can look at a small business owner and say, I have been there. Right. You know, when you're 30 years old and you have a million dollar condominium in Washington, D.C., you come back to, you know, Manchester and say, I'm one of you. I have Grand State roots. I have Grand State in my blood. No, you don't. Your biggest struggle was like your know, cappuccino had too much foam. <laughs> um, but, for the, but for the folks at home, you know, there's, there's a clear choice in the primary. Yep. I'm fluffy, so I liken it to food. My opponent is Starbucks and Whole Foods. I'm Dunks and Market Basket. There you go. So, you know, if, you know, if you're asking your friends, like, how do you make that? How, you can t how can you tell the two mats apart? Dunks and Market Basket, Whole Foods, Starbucks. Yep. Um, so Says the, re a lot. the Republican primary is on Tuesday, September 8th, just I think four weeks from now, yes. maybe five, four weeks. Four. So um, if you need an absentee ballot, yep, you yes, can please. get one. You can go to, uh, first of all, you can probably go to Matt's website. I bet that there's a link to it there. Yes. Ooh, um, you can I go to the. Put that on my website. I know. Too. I, if it's <laughs> not on the I mean, Manchester, I've been handing them out. And ManchesterGOP.com should have a link to it. But if nothing else, you can go to ManchesterNH.gov forward slash city clerk. Request an absentee ballot right there. I mean, I see no reason why people can't go and vote at the polls, but if it will make you more comfortable with all things concerning the virus and, uh, you know, less than one, three, or three one hundredths of a percent. Of That's like it's zero point zero 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 I'm going to vote in the polls. But I'm going to vote. Minute. I'm going to vote in the polls. And while you're in there, you can pick up this great book, <laughs> The Static Pessimist, by our friend Carla Garrick. Aw, thank awesome. you. I, I've got my signed copy here. Yay! It's I'm available on Amazon. Or better yet, just call Carla. You can. Yeah. Especially eight six five seven one four zero. Exactly. And I bet she'll deliver with a lawn sign. Right. I right. will. So, but, and I will drop one off for so you. So this is Matt Mayberry. You can get more information at mayberryforcongress.com. Um, like he said, phone number 603-969-7077. If you have any questions for him, he will answer his phone and he will talk to you personally. Um, that's all we've got for this week. We ran out of wow. time again because we always run out of time. That was um, so Enjoy fun. the rest of this hot, hot week coming up and we'll be back next week with more fun and exciting things to talk about. That's all we got. Bye.